Jesus, from our tradition, would say, whenever two or more are gathered in my name, I am in their midst. So we gather today in the midst, in our midst, and in the midst of Christ. We welcome you today. Lumina, Lumina Desert Ministries is committed to welcoming all. We like to say that whoever we are, whoever you are, wherever you are in your journey of faith, you are welcome here. We also often say that all, all are welcome who welcome all. And I don't quite like that phrase because that means that those that we don't, we don't welcome those who don't welcome all. For instance, if Justice Scalia walked in, <laughs> I would welcome him. So I think sometimes, you know, our, our, the umbrella is big. And that's why we welcome everybody, regardless of economic status or color or uh, sexual orientation or whatever it happens to be on the whole spectrum of the rainbow and the whole spectrum of from rich to poor and from, from light to brown to, to dark brown or whatever it happens to be, everybody is welcome to here, including Justice Scalia's body, mind, and spirit for the last week and perhaps even this morning. So, let us gather together in worship. Let us bring our hearts and minds and souls and strength together. Please rise as you are able and join me in this class of cultivation. While waiting for the best time, we lose many moments while clinging to regret. We do not While wrestling with possibility. While worried about the future. Our present becomes past. The glory of God's grace is its ability to help us find peace within ourselves. We celebrate this birthright and say together, Shalom, 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 Shalom. Amen. This is the time in our worship when in faith we open our hearts to ministry. Prayer for God and growth. Now in prayer, we welcome the spiritual embrace of God that comes with openness and reconciliation. Many have cried out to God, desperate for a response. But what if none comes? If we exalt his silence, and let it be so, for silence can be broken, even the most faint sign of grace is separated. Do not shun the silence, and say aloud the tears, the loud and sad song. Our sound will rise and reach the ears of the angels, who will be compelled to join our chorus of sadness, and soon the harmony of words will begin to form a new song, more than pain and beautiful in its song. So, so the glorious sound, sound that heaven and nature will have no choice but to join the symphony, exalting life, uplifting the souls of the saints, and in return to the living soul. Creator, ever listening counselor, receive thoughts and energies of our silent meditation and prayer. And to all our silent prayers, let the people say, Amen. Amen. God's love and grace are our reason and our fuel for creating a new world. 
beginning with loving ourselves and culminating in service to others. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. This has been a week like none other. And I pause and look back on my own life. Early in July 1968, I started agitating for marriage equality. More than almost 47 years, more than half my life. But as I saw a sign in the church service I looked at this morning, which said, Love wins. We did it! That's how I feel this morning. Today's scripture reading comes to us, not as the page in front of me says, from 1 Samuel, but from 2 Samuel. This is the lament on the death of Jonathan and Saul. Written probably about 120 years after the event, and it's something to be remembered. After Saul's death, David returned from his victory over the Amicalites and spent two days in Ziklazag. David took the lament for Saul and Jonathan and honored that the song of the bow he taught to the Judeans. It is written, the book of Jasher shall your glory, Israel, be supply slain. How the mighty have fallen. Do not announce it in Gath. Do not proclaim it on the streets of Ashkelon. Let the daughters of the Philistines rejoice, lest the daughters of the heathen exalt. Heights of Gilboa may neither do nor rain refresh you. Our deep springs take your fields out lush, for there the tarnished shields of warriors lie. Saw shields glimmered no more from the blood of the dead, from the flesh of the fallen. Jonathan's bow did not fail, nor did Saul's sword return untarnished. Saul and Jonathan loved and cherished in life never apart or in death. Both swift as eagles and strong as lions. Daughters of Israel, weep for Saul, who clothed you in scarlet and adorned you in gold. How the mighty have fallen in the heat of the battle, Jonathan lies slain on your heights. I grieve for you, my brother Jonathan. You are my delight, my sweet, your love was marvelous to me, more wonderful than the love of women. How the mighty have fallen, the war machines have perished. Here is the reading from the book of Second Samuel. The gospel reading today comes to us from the book of Mark. Chapter 5, verses 21 through 43. When Jesus had crossed again to the other shore in the boat, a large crowd gathered, and he stayed by the lakeside. Then one of the synagogue officials, Jairus by name, came up, and seeing Jesus, fell down and pleaded earnestly, saying, My little daughter is desperately sick. Come and lay your hands on her to make her better and save her life. Jesus went with him, and a large crowd followed, pressing from all sides. Now there was a woman who had suffered from hemorrhages for twelve years. After long and painful treatment from various doctors, she had spent all she had without getting better. In fact, she was getting worse. 
She had heard about Jesus, and she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. If I can touch even the hem, she had told herself, I will be well again. Immediately, the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Immediately aware that healing power had gone out from him, Jesus turned to the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? The disciples said, You see the crowd pressing you, and yet you say, Who touched me? But Jesus continued to look around to see who had done it. <coughs> then the woman came forward, frightened and trembling because she knew what had happened to her, and she fell at Jesus' feet and told him the whole truth. My daughter, Jesus said, your faith has saved you. Go. Go in peace. Be free of your affliction. While Jesus was still speaking, some people arrived from the house of the synagogue officials to say, Your daughter is dead. Why put the teacher to any further trouble? But Jesus overheard the remark and said to the official, Don't be afraid. Just believe. Jesus allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and James's brother John. They came to the official's house, and Jesus noticed all the commotion with people weeping and wailing unrestrainedly. Jesus went into them and said, Why all this commotion and crying? The child is not dead, but asleep. At this they began to ridicule him and told everyone to leave. Jesus took the child's mother and father, and his own companions had entered the room where the child lay. Taking her hand, he said to her, Talitha, whom? Which means, little girl, get up. Immediately, the girl, who was 12 years old, got up and began to walk about. At this, they were overcome with astonishment. Here ends the reading of the Gospel. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to preface my uh, commentary with just a, a, a little, two little notices. One is I tend to speak fast. I will try to be measured, but a measured person I'm But I will attempt for you. Uh, the second is I have to use my hands, otherwise nothing comes out of my mouth. So hopefully that will happen. I am Italian after all. And the third is uh, I've been working around uh, TLPT community for, for many years of my life. And uh, as those letters grew and became GLBTTQIA question mark, I think is what we're up to, I suddenly realized it's, it's becoming a little bit absurd. All of us can be kind of reduced to a letter or letters. And so the whole thing seems to be a little ineffective to just keep adding letters. So I coined my own term, of alphabet people. So I consider <laughs> that long string of alphabet people. We're all alphabet people uh, in that fact that we can be reduced to certain letters, but we all are part of one large alphabet. We should never lose sight of that. We're all one people. So in my, uh, in my commentary today, you'll hear that phrase used, so you'll have some understanding of that. So in opening prayer, I want to add a little bonus scripture for you today, and I'm going to be paraphrasing from Ezekiel uh, 13. Because they have misled my people, saying peace when no peace. And because when the people build a wall, these prophets whitewash it, I say to those who would whitewash it, that it shall fall. There will be a deluge of rain, great hailstones will fall, and stormy wind will break out. I will make a storm out of my wrath, and there shall be a deluge of rain in my anger, and great hailstones of wrath to destroy that wall. I will deliver my people out of your hands, and then you will know that I am the Lord. It's a very fiery passage, I enjoy it. Uh, two things occur in that passage from Ezekiel. One is, it's the fact that the people 
not the leaders are the ones who build walls to separate each other out. The second is the fact that he condemns those leaders who take advantage of the walls that the people have built by sanctioning it, glorifying it, and often profiting from the walls that are built. The context of this today being Stonewall Sunday, the wall that we're going to discuss is a bar. Uh, the aptly named Stonewall Inn. The bar exemplified the status of alphabet people in 1969, marginalized by society, criminalized by political leaders, demonized by religious influencers, and profited off of by a mafia that, uh, you may not know, ran many of the bars, of, of gay and lesbian bars at that time. And they were preyed upon by the police. Now, I, like many of you, knew this story from the beginning, and uh, particularly because I was living across the river there in New Jersey in 1969, where it happened. I was old enough to understand my, my parents were big on the news. But it wasn't until I came back to that story a second time and really looked again at the Stonewall riots, which, uh, again, is considered a catalyst to breaking down the wall put up around alphabet people. And I started to realize that I believe that it is not simply an isolated incident, but instead it is one of a series of walls that society has over time built, torn down, and rebuilt to maintain the status quo. Now at that time, I went back to college and I was attending the University of the District of Columbia in Washington, D.C., your nation's capital. And that is one of our nation's historically black colleges and universities. Clearly, I don't fit that definition. And so as a minority in that college, I had a very different experience than many of their students had. It was one that actually the professors often um, was glad to have, for the first time in many years, a white student sitting in the class. It really made the conversation different to have that to be seen and not talked about outside of the class. He felt it made, it forced, my presence forced the black students in the room to think deeper about what prejudice was. Because there was a person who they would have been demonizing sitting with them learning the same thing. And so that serves as an important lesson for me throughout my life in terms of having our stories told. Now in that class, it was called uh, The Power of Movement Politics, a very, very a lofty name. And in that, we learned that black Americans had, uh, had endured a series of injustices over time. The walls built for the, before them being slavery, Jim Crow, denials in land ownership, marriage, voting, housing, education. We also learned about women suffragettes seeking the vote, child labor abuses, immigrants struggles. Each time we learned that the group had had enough, they rose up and demanded to be heard, to be recognized for their contributions to their dignity and a chance to live authentic, joyful lives. Over and over, each group walked up to that wall society had erected as a barrier to them and said, this wall shall not stand. My professor at that time, he was a civil rights leader, it's Reverend uh, Dr. Luther S. Buck, uh, often used um, uh, religious verses to end his um, uh, class for the day. Found inspiring, although sometimes a little odd. And I kind of zoned out a little bit on it, but one struck me once when he read from the, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5. This is the Sermon on the Mount. It's particularly interesting, I actually look back at this time. It's the very first time that Jesus speaks publicly and makes a sermon in public. Um, and uh, as you know, the first things that people say are usually the things that are most people will remember, first and last things that are said. And in it, there are two verses that really stood out, and he used them at this time. He said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you, falsely on my account. And that was it. And I was struck at that time. Suddenly my perception of people oppressed had flipped. When I thought, oh, these are people marginalized or the least of society, I realized and said that they are a blessed people favored by God. And this doesn't mean we should allow them to stay you know, at this sort of lesser status because they are blessed. Instead, I believe we are uh, commanded by God to address this injustices. Therefore, uh, working as one of them or working to help people in that sense is itself a blessed endeavor. It's for us to pursue and support. This prayer also reinforced the notion that these walls being built up over time have been going on for a very long time. In fact, obviously being addressed in biblical times, because this was happening. 
As we look at America and what walls have come up, it's, it's kind of ironic. The first ones that come up are for people who are not supporting Britain. The loyal, non-loyalists are shunned. That flips, and suddenly as we become America, the loyalists themselves are shunned. As time moves on, walls are built to wall off slaves, and non-landowners, and women, and immigrants, and communists, and war protesters, and pregnant women, and alphabet people, and Muslim Americans, just to name a few. This is a stone wall made of bricks of prejudice, elementally made of ignorance, intolerance, fear of the other, terror of the unknown, a clinging to power, or preservation of some perceived scarcity of resources. Those in power so fear sharing it or losing it, they begin to create demonizing tales of those they've walled off. Blacks are violent. Women aren't smart enough for an education or to vote. Immigrants take jobs or smuggle drugs. All Muslims are terrorists. Gay men are weak, promiscuous, have no interest in marriage or family. These whitewashing myths, they're created to reinforce the prejudicial walls in society. And those stereotypes that they create help shore up that wall. And then suddenly there are excuses and justification from leaders, like the whitewashing from Ezekiel. They make that wall very pretty, palatable, for people to walk by and perhaps not even notice. Behind that come the laws, which sustain the injustice. I think you can witness a really good whitewashing right now in the Confederate flag debate. I would tell you it is not a historic symbol of Southern pride. It has very short history, in fact, in its lifetime. It was a battle flag of the Confederacy, used by only just a few generals at the time during the Civil War. And once the war was over, that flag was retired. In fact, even General Robert E. Lee is quoted at the necessity for society to leave such things in the past. This uh, oppressive symbol lay dormant for nearly a century until the civil rights movements of the 1960s. Then it began to find favor among people who wanted to battle again against racial integration and civil rights legislation. Thus, they picked up the symbol of war and made it a symbol of bigotry. And I will tell you, any other myths created around it is simply whitewashing of the fact and a futile attempt of a few to buttress a crumbling wall. These societal stone walls will eventually fall with the achievement of justice, but the stones that were used to build them lay scattered around the ground. We let them lie there. Ignorance, intolerance, and fear, they no longer make a wall, but they stay on the ground, and we walk past them. The problem with that is, those who are drawn to fear and ignorance or, pre uh, or prejudice something come by and pick them up and rebuild the wall to wall off the people behind them. In order to stop this process, we must not simply address the injustice of the moment, such as the rights of alphabet people to marry now. Instead, we must ground down those stones so that they might be used again to wall off another people. So how do we do that, John? Well, I'll tell you, I think the answer is a simple one. By telling our stories. Mary Frances Berry, a woman I admire, a professor of history at the University of Pennsylvania. She was also a former chairwoman of the United States Commission on Civil Rights. She addresses this eloquently in her book, The Pig Farmer's Daughter and Other Tales of American Justice and Injustice. She writes that the laws won't change until leaders' perceptions change. You have a legislature or a court of people who know of no alphabet people and only know the myths and, and rumors about them. They use those myths and rumors and stereotypes to form their perceptions. And therefore, justice will never be achieved. The, the stories they tell each other in those closed rooms will be the whitewash they need to validate their wrongful positions. We must change those perceptions by having our stories told. When they hear about, see, and meet alphabet people seeking equal, not special, participation in society, the myth can no longer be sustained. The truth contained in our stories shall be the storm of rain and hail that shall remove that whitewash, exposing the underlying stones, the fear and the ignorance, and the wind of our combined voices shall cause the walls to fall. Now, my own family history of marriage, a series of barriers overcome. As I thought about it and thought back, uh, it just had occurred to me. My great-grandfather came from Italy. 
uh, to America to find a wife and start a family in a land where he felt where it was more promising. My, the next generation, my maternal Jewish grandmother hid her faith, pretending to be black Irish so that she could marry an Irish sailor. She hid that until her death. We didn't learn that until it was in her, in her will, where she let us know that. Uh, my parents, one being Italian and one being Irish, faced ridicule and scorn in a Boston community which frowned upon such mixing. It seemed very indelicate and very ugly to the people at that time. My niece, dating a young black man, and my nephew, marrying a Filipino woman, questioned both by the communities they lived in and my own family. Finally, Wayne and I, only yesterday, having had our marriage fully recognized by our country, yet still reviled by some in our society. Each generation I found in my family has expanded marriage's scope, love triumphed for them, and for all of us, particularly with this latest ruling from the Supreme Court. We should be proud and we should be celebrated, but I caution, we must resist the temptation to pick up those stones and use them against our persecutors to wall them away, even as they attempt to salvage their own prejudices. I'll give you an example of what's going on right now, particularly with this marriage. So conservative religious leaders long demonizing alphabet people as they preached and fought against marriage equality. They used stones of hatred, fear, and fault witness to keep many of God's beloved from this blessed institution. Now they themselves are about to face the, the wrath of the wall which they erected. You hear their wails now in preparation for it, saying that this newly expanded justice and equality is instead an attack on Christianity. Uh, and that it would be justified as human nature for us to want to wall off their antiquated and bigoted voices. Human nature, yes, but not in God's nature. Instead, we must not seek retribution from them and build a wall to block them off. Instead, we must engage them. We must tell our stories more. We must live authentically. The more we progress, the more we trample those stones and turn them to cinder, paving the road for the next group behind us. <clears throat> now, it's easy to see these big walls that society makes to block off segments of it. What's less apparent are the walls that groups inwardly erect to block <clears throat> off those that greater society would think are the same. I became aware of such examples of these inner walls when I had an opportunity to join Washington, D.C.'s Capital Pride Committee in 2005. At our very first meeting, we were to hear presentations from different groups about what kind of event they wanted to have at Pride. The idea that they would present, the committee would give them ideas on how to make the event better, or maybe shift it around, or find a spot in the calendar, and then move on to the next group. I didn't realize there was actually going to be a vote involved. The very first group that came up was a transgender group, and they were offering a series of workshops throughout the day, and then a dinner and awards banquet at night. I thought, wow, this is great. I had never seen this before in all my time in Washington, D.C. This is going to be easy. I can't even see what anybody would even want to adjust. Instead of a conversation, suddenly they were said, thank you, we need you to leave the room. The committee looked at each other, and suddenly I heard word or phrases saying, well, they're not even gay. Well, they never help with anything but their own stuff. Well, we already have drag queens. Why do we need them? These were the remarks that I heard of gay and lesbian members of a pride committee. I was astounded. I'd never heard such a thing in my life. So we voted, and I was the only one to vote yes. At the end of the vote, they said, well, someone needs to go out and talk to them. And they were all afraid to. And they were all saying, well, you do it, you do it. And the chairman said, well, we'll just send them a letter. We'll tell them we're still buffing it up, and we'll just send them a letter. And I was so angry that I got to say, at least I have the balls, excuse my French, to go and tell them that. And I got up and walked out of the room and met with him in the hall. I was about to say, I'm sorry, you've been denied. Instead, the spirit came inside of me, and I said, I have a church, and we will host your event. And I know it was the spirit that spoke to me at that time. That spirit lingered in me, and we did. We put on the first uh, Capital Pride in my church. I'm very, very proud of that, or excuse me, trans pride at the church. But that feeling, that naggingness in me lingered, and I thought, if there's one group out there that has been walled off by us, are there others? There must be others. So I talked to the minister about it, and the church said, let's find them. And so we did. So we sought out to find the other groups that had been walled off by our own alphabet people.
and we uncovered youth. The committee was afraid to have a youth party because it would fear that society would think that we were pedophiles trying to prey on the youth. So we had youth coming into the city, the parade's over, and having nowhere safe to go, wandering <coughs> streets. How was that better? So we held a youth dance. We learned at that time that men on the down low, particularly men of color, who didn't accept the white model of Madonna and, you know, and disco dancing for being what being gay was. They couldn't relate to that. And so they didn't participate, and yet felt that they were included. And we reached out to them and held a DL event, which was a series of movies and a talk of a party afterwards. I was told no one would come. The fact that they're on the down low would mean they would never come. To a, you know, to a vet, they like to be hidden. And we had a hundred and some people show up, an event that we were told nobody would come to. People involved in healthcare, I was stunned to see that nobody wanted to talk about healthcare during Pride. So we held a, a wellness night of Pride at the church. So I'm proud of all those moments. Um, but I think that what we have to understand is, this little secret to the inside, is that when we perceive that a group is, is combined and facing, when a wall comes down, sometimes there are still other walls that have to be addressed in the groups themselves. Finally, I want to just touch very briefly on the final walls that we're dealing with. We have these large society walls. We have these little inner walls. This is the one that's the most sensitive. It's the smallest, but I think it's often the most impeding of one's personal progress for the march towards their God-granted authenticity. And this is the wall we build around ourselves. I see that there's two ways that I see this wall being built up, and I've experienced both of them. Uh, one is that once these large walls from society get held, they get knocked down, some people still feel like they can't believe it. They believe the wall is still there. They still live as though the wall still exists. They cannot find it in themselves to move forward. They are so entrenched in what they were told in terms of the shame um, that was built up and their unworthiness to move forward, that they live as though that wall is still there. The other way is more subtle even than that and more dangerous than that. And these are the things said about us and the way that people react to us that create us to build up a defensive wall. Phrases said like, oh, you'll never amount to anything. No one will ever marry you. Why do you need to go to college? The factory's fine for me. Who do you think you are? You think you're better than us? Comments like these are the bricks that we hand young people to wall themselves in. Societal walls, inner walls, walls of the self, so long as we allow these walls to be built, marginalizing anyone or any group, we perpetuate damaging, and in the end, unnecessary suffering. Again, the solution? Let your voices be heard. Begin by sharing your story, whoever you are, with people. If that frightens you, <laughs> then find someone that you really trust or that, that loves you. There are people who have none, no one to speak to. Then come to Bloom, seek out someone here and speak within our Bloom community. If even that is too much, then pray. And if you seek prayer and find no words can come, then cry. God is listening. Now let us pray. Here in their cry, God delivered the children of Israel from the house of bondage. In everlasting love, God made a covenant with Abraham and Sarah to bless all things on earth. Loving us still, God makes us today new heirs of this covenant, like a mother who will not forsake a nursing child, like a father who runs to welcome the prodigal home. God is faithful still, as is Jesus who shows us that God's grace for us is justified in faith and sets us free to accept ourselves and to love God and neighbor. Same Spirit who inspired the prophets and apostles, engage us through the word, proclaim, feeds us with the bread of life and the cup of salvation. It steals us when we need the strength to stand our ground and limbers us like a willow to allow the breath of hatred to pass us by. In an often broken and fearful world, God provides us courage to confront inequity, to hear the voices of people long silenced, and to work with others for justice, freedom, and peace. We express our gratitude by living joyful, authentic lives and help others to do the same. Let us rejoice in nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. On my own, what I have to give doesn't amount to much in the light of all you have given me in the face of so much need. 
put together as a congregation, what we offer you here in love becomes more, not simply added together, but somehow multiplied in its usefulness. We ask you to bless our gifts and with the addition of your blessing, just as it was with the loaves and fishes, that there is enough for all. Amen. Amen. The way that you are able, and let us pray together the prayer given to us from Jesus, using the words most familiar and comforting to you, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. That was taught to us by Jesus. Our Father, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but to deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.